The MCAT Cars Podcast, session number 49. The car section of the MCAT gives thousands of pre-meds nightmares every night. Whether you're an ESL student, lack confidence while reading, or a slow reader like me, Jack Weston and the medical school headquarters are here to help you score higher in every section so you can be confident you are ready to get the MCAT score of your dreams. And welcome to the MCAT Cars Podcast. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray, and I'm excited that you have taken some time today to listen to us. I'm joined by Jack Weston from jackweston.com. Before we go any further, I want to remind you that we have a lot of other amazing podcasts at mededmedia.com or our new URL. You can go to premedpodcasts.com. That's premedpodcast with an S.com. Today, we have another great episode breaking down another article for you. Don't forget to follow along in the show notes if you would like. Jack Weston back for some more MCAT Cars podcast. What's new in the MCAT Cars world at jackweston.com? Everything's great. Yeah, we just launched a Chrome extension. Yeah, I've been talking about that. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of students have trouble with accessing the AAMC passages, the practice passages, specifically cars question packs and physics and uh, chemistry uh, question packs and so and so forth. Uh, You know, as you may not may know or may not know, um, the interface is not exactly like the MCAT for whatever reason, their practice interface, the design where you access the the questions. And it's kind of annoying for students Mm -hmm. because you can't go backwards, can't really highlight that well strike there just doesn't look like the real test and and that's practice 101 right practice like you play exactly exactly yeah so i mean you always want to have that practice environment to look as much like the actual test as possible right i mean it it makes you more comfortable makes you more aware of how the test works um so yeah so exactly like we students want this right and the amc for whatever reason does not provide it so what we've done is We've created a Chrome extension. It's an it's an extension. It's an add-on to your Chrome browser for Google Chrome, um, where you click a button and it changes the design right of your of your practice stuff to the actual MCAT design and all of its features for the most part. Uh, we just launched it. It's going to take a little while for us to perfect it, uh, but we're optimistic. We're going to make it really really easy to use. We've gotten a lot of great feedback so far. Um, and we're making those changes, making it easier. There are some bugs or some issues with it right now, but it's definitely something to check out within the next couple months or even now just to check out what, how it looks and how it functions. Uh, but yeah, we're, you know, we're very excited to help students uh, conquer this test using the actual AMC stuff. I mean, look, the AMC stuff is the best, right? Yep. You have to use the AMC questions. And why not use it in their actual MCAT format, right? So that's what our goal is to help students with. And all, a lot of our own students, um, you know, complain about it. You know, they are, they, they are, they're really tired of, of the AMC's design format. So this was really designed to help our students. But if we can help, you know, more than just our students and anyone out there that needs it, that's great. And how do people find that extension? They can just Google Jack Weston Chrome extension. MCAT Chrome extension, and it'll, it'll probably be the first thing that pops up. You can also go check it out at the Chrome web store. Chrome has a web store that you can just search Jack Weston and you'll find it there. Um, yeah, you can just download it. It's install it and you should be able to use it immediately. I, I do recommend that you always reset all your questions before you use it. Um, you know, resetting all your questions on the actual practice interface, because right now they have this feature where you, 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 the only way you can reset it is by clicking a button. And I recommend that you click that so you don't have any issues. Cool. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a very useful feature. It's not perfect. We are working on making it better. But if you have any suggestions, we're always welcome to you know, hearing you out. Support at jackweston.com is where you can always reach us. Nice. All right. So we have some more MCAT cars passages here, our article to go through. What do we have for us today? Yeah, so this is a pretty straightforward passage. Um, kind of on the boring side, I like it, but you know, it depends <laughs> on the student. Depends, you know, it's very subjective. What's interesting, what's not interesting, um, but very straightforward. 
All righty. If you want to follow along, follow along in our show notes or in your podcast app, tap on the article link in there. First paragraph here. One of my favorite words is locks, says Gregory Guy, a professor of linguistics at NYU, New York University, um, which most students are aware of NYU because they have free tuition now at their medical school. Um, right. So right off the bat, we're given uh, a person. I always like to remember these people. So Gregory Guy is a professor of linguistics and his favorite word is locks. Um, so I think uh, potentially what's going to trip up some people here is I don't know what locks is, but as we always kind of say here, let's just keep reading and see if they tell us what the word is. That's it. Okay. There's hardly a more quintessential New York food than a lox bagel, a century-old popular appetizing store, Russ and Daughters, calls it the classic. All right, so now we know that it's a, uh, it's a food, uh, a lox bagel, so we don't know if this is the type of bagel it is or something else, uh, and then apparently it's quintessential New York, and again, that's kind of a a big word for ESL students potentially not knowing what quintessential means. But again, if we keep reading, maybe it'll it'll tell us a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, you don't really need to know what that word means. As long as you know it's New York food, yep. then you're good, right? Quintessential means like the most representative, yeah. basically. Um, like It's a well-known New York food. Yeah, greatest embodiment yeah. of New York. Go ahead. Okay. But Guy who has lived in the city for the past 17 years, is passionate about locks for a different reason. All right, so uh, we're given this a guy, uh, this professor again, uh, is saying, hey, he, he likes the word for, for something other than potentially the food that it is. The pronunciation in the Proto-Indo-European was probably locks. And that's exactly how it is pronounced in modern English, he says. And so a little bit of history of the, the word there. Then it meant salmon. And now it specifically means smoked salmon. So now we are told what lox is. It's smoked salmon. And he's just, he's taking us through kind of the history of the word of what it meant and what it means now. It's really cool that the word hasn't changed its pronunciation at all in 8,000 years and still refers to a particular fish. So our opening paragraph here is, is a linguistics professor, right? So obviously someone who likes language and we're focusing on a specific word and he's kind of giving us the word and what it means. And he likes that it hasn't changed in 8,000 years, the pronunciation and, and that it still means the same thing. Yeah, which is super interesting, right? Like literally 8,000 years ago, if you said, hey, let me get some locks, it meant the same thing as it does today, salmon. Yep. Um, yeah, great. Okay, so big picture here is they educate you on what lox is. So if you don't know salmon, but that doesn't really matter as much. What they care more about, the point that the author is really trying to emphasize on is that the, lang the word hasn't changed. How do I know that's more important than the meaning of the word? Um, that it's more important um, I don't know. It's based on how the author presents information, the language the author uses, the wording, the way the conversation plays out. And that's something that a lot of ESL students have trouble with, right? They doubt themselves. They think, well, how do I know if this is important or that's important? It's just like any other conversation you've had. Right? You have to ask yourself, what's the purpose of this paragraph? What's the purpose of the author saying this stuff? Right? What direction is the author headed in? Mm. For now, I think it's definitely the direction of how Locke's, the word, the meaning hasn't changed. But maybe that direction is wrong. Maybe the author does care more about the actual, the actual definition of Locke's, right? or you know, the actual food that it, that it pertains to. So we don't know, but it's it's really just guesswork until it's more obvious. And the way the author presents this stuff, it says in in a very in a very clear way that someone else says this, right? Guy believes this. Why would the author be mentioning Guy, right, and their point of view if they didn't care about it? So it's obvious to me that the author is going in this direction of okay, I want to be focused on the history of the word more than 
just the meaning of the word. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Paragraph two. How scholars have traced the word's pronunciation over thousands of years is also really cool. All right. So, so again, we, get, we have really cool, which I think most people understand that the author really likes this and, and is obviously focusing on that. The story goes back to Thomas Young, also known as, quote, the last person who knew everything. <laughs> um, all right. So, so we're given a name here. He's got a very nice title, uh, the last person who knew everything. Uh, and I guess we're going to get a little bit of a history of how we're pr pronouncing the word. The 18th century British polymath came up with the wave theory of light, first described astigmatism and played a key role in deciphering the Rosetta Stone. All right, so we're given a little bit of history of who this Thomas Young is, 18th century British polymath. I don't know what a polymath is, but... Um, we're given some of his accomplishments, the, the wave right. theory of light and astigmatism and the Rosetta Stone. Like some people before him, Young noticed eerie similarities between Indic and European languages. All right, so he's a, a linguist person as well. He went further, analyzing 400 languages spread across continents and millennia and proved that the overlap between some of them was too extensive to be an accident. All right, so now we're getting, getting a little bit of history of language here that Thomas Young has provided us. A single coincidence meant nothing, but each additional one increased the chance of an underlying connection. All right, so the, the author kind of showing us the, the, the connections and coincidences and what, what that particularly meant. No, nothing real... Uh, uh, mind-blowing at this point, it doesn't seem, but we'll finish off the paragraph here. In 1813, Young declared that all those languages belong to one family. All right, so Young, uh, given a time here, specific time, and uh, and kind of describing all of, all of languages or a lot of languages as, as one family of languages. He named it Indo-European. And so now we have the name, so Indo-European name which kind of goes back to paragraph one because we have proto-Indo-European, so it's a little bit different, but kind of similar. Sounds good. So what's the point of this paragraph? Uh, so we're introduced to Thomas Young, uh, and the majority of the paragraph is just uh, his story of comparing languages and the similarities between languages. Yeah, specifically the Indic and the European. So he coined this Indic Indo European kind of terminology, right? Which predates all of our languages essentially, right? It mm -hmm. goes back to um, this one ancestor, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Paragraph three. Today, roughly half the world's population speaks an Indo European language. That's interesting. So we're given the extent of this language. That family includes 440 languages spoken across the globe, including English. Okay. So again, more, more of the extent. The word yoga, for example, which comes from Sanskrit, the language of ancient India, is a distant relative of the English word yoki, Y-O-K-E. Um, all right, so a little bit of a, a history lesson, yoki, yoga. Maybe that's where yogi comes from. You're a yogi. Um, mm -hmm. the nature of this relationship puzzled historical linguists for two centuries. So, uh, it, it looks like this one is just mostly, uh, a history lesson of the Indo-European language, how prevalent it is. And then a specific example of these words here. Right. This is an example, right? And notice we're not talking about locks anymore. Yeah. So locks seem to be the main idea, right? Yeah. See, maybe the whole passage was about locks. But apparently it's not, right? The passage is, the article is going towards the history of words, right? So that's what happens on these tests, on these, on these passages. They'll bring in something in the first paragraph or the first two paragraphs that don't necessarily contain any element of the main idea or any element of the point the author really wants you to know. And usually you can find that main idea. Usually you can find the point the author is trying to get across halfway through or near the end of each article you read. That's typically the way it works. Yeah. First couple paragraphs introduce something just to get you interested. 
and then they delve into it more and more. And being able to keep track of that structure, understanding how we went from the first paragraph to the second to the third is a skill. It's something that you have to develop, right? And if once you start developing that skill, you understand things a lot better and you'll be able to answer questions a lot faster. It's it's almost the the way you're describing it and the way that it looks. It's it's almost like a bait and switch. Like I'm going to lure you in with this and then I'm going to switch it up and confuse you. But as long as you're ready for that, right? If if like you think of movies, right? The 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 good guys always know it seems like that they're walking into a trap, yet they still walk into it uh and and face the consequences. And so as long as you know that there potentially is a switch coming up, it won't catch you off guard and you're you're ready for it and and accepting of it. That's exactly it. Yeah, that's a great analogy. I mean, look, it, it, in the beginning, they have to catch your attention, right? So you'll see like the bad guys kind of win in the beginning, right? Yep. And like something crazy happens. But then over time, you realize, okay, that's, you know, the reason why they brought that up is to show you the end result, right? And it, like you said, if you anticipate it, you embrace it, you're, you're, you're not going to be alarmed. You're not, you're not going to be confused. I see a lot of students, they just don't want to read, right? They just don't, they hate reading, right? Yeah. Especially cars passages because they don't, they don't want to, right? Why, why am I reading a passage about locks? But that's what doctors do, right? They do things they don't want to do all the time. So you have to embrace just doing things you don't like to do and making it, making the best out of it. And I think if you actually pay attention and you embrace this, you're going to learn something new. You're going to learn that you know, multiple languages, including English, are related to one another. I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah. You know, okay. All right, paragraph four. In modern English, well over half of all words are borrowed from other languages. All right, so now we're talking about English specifically and the extent of, of where our language comes from. To trace how language changes over time, linguists developed an ingenious toolkit. All right, so the author's setting us up uh, for a little bit of a lesson on how we trace language. Quote, some parts of vocabulary are more stable and don't change as much. Uh, all right, so just more, more lesson on language. The linguistic term for these words is, quote, a core vocabulary. Um, all right. So now I'm a little bit confused. The linguistic term for these words is a core vocabulary. I don't really know what that means. Uh, so that, that's the terminology they use for okay. the quote before it, like the sentence before it. Some parts of vocabulary are more stable and don't oh. change. That's the core. The okay. core doesn't change. All right. Now I get it. So the, this sentence is, is describing the sentence before it. All right. Yeah. Usually... They'll say, oh, we came up with core vocabulary, and that means the following. Yeah. But they're using a different structure here. Yeah. Right. Okay. Fancy, fancy authors. All right. <laughs> These are numbers, colors, family relations like mother, father, sister, brother, and basic verbs like walk and see, says Guy. All right. So now he's, the author is showing us what that core vocabulary looks like. If you look at words of that sort in different languages, it becomes fairly clear which ones are related and which ones are not. So we're, we're again, being told uh, how these languages compare and how we find these core languages, core vocabulary, rather. Yeah, so it's so interesting, right? Like if you compare English to French, maybe those complicated words are not similar, so you can't see any relation. Mm -hmm. But if you start using the core vocab, right, like, like different things that they mention, like numbers and colors, you'll start seeing similarities, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for a lot of the words that we, we kind of understand from other, other languages. But go yeah. ahead. For example, take the English word for number two, which is dva in Russian and du in French. Or the word night, which is nach in German and nach in Russian. There you go. So they sound yeah, very similar. Won. Yeah, I mean, that's always been on my mind, right? Like, if you think about it, many of the words in Spanish or, you know, French are very similar to English. At least they come up with similar kind of uh, letters to begin mm -hmm. with or end with, or they kind of, you know, they, they look similar. Yeah. 
And this is explaining why they came from one ancestor, right? This Indo kind of, uh, you know, whatever they call it, this Indo-European kind of language. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, All right. Last paragraph here. Analyzing the patterns of change that words undergo moving from one language to another showed how to unwind these changes and identify the possible or uh, originals. So again, talking more about language and how we we figure out where they come from. Reconstructed vocabulary of Indo-European is based on a comparison of descendant languages, explains Guy. So again, just repeating basically the same sentence. You collect words that mean more or less the same thing in all the languages, and if they look like each other in terms of their pronunciation, then it's a good candidate for a descendant form of a common ancestor. It's it's almost that as we're reading this, we talk all the time about trying to actively read and and trying to enjoy what we're reading. And all that I can think of when I'm reading this is I'm picturing... uh, I've seen a lot on Facebook lately of, hey, look at my great grandmother when she was my age. Look how similar we look, right? This You can find these common ancestors and how they look alike. And um, so I'm just trying to compare words to people and ancestors in that way. Yeah, that's great. Now, here's the thing. Okay. So um, when you read something and you start understanding it, you start enjoying it more, right? Because you, when, you, when you're good at something, you enjoy it more right? If you're good at, let's say, tennis, you're going to like it more, right? Yeah. So that's something that you, that many students are not aware of, right? That, look, you can start enjoying reading and answering cars questions if you are good at it and you can learn how to be good at it. It's a skill. You can, you can, you can work on those little things that, that differentiate a high scoring student from a lower scoring student. Uh, but when you're comparing, when you're reading things, Ryan, I love how you're making it kind of relatable to things you you've seen in the past. Mm-hmm. You really want to try to focus on how they're interpreting it mm. because you may bring in a bias accidentally if if you're not careful with exactly how they bring it in. Does that make sense? Yeah, that so, does. Uh, you, when when like when they their MCAT will ask a question about this stuff, but they want you to know it's based on core vocabulary. That's a huge point. And yeah. if, if you didn't catch that and you, let's say you use something else that comes to your mind, like faces, right. Or whatever, you may end up picking the wrong answer because you misinterpreted what the author was saying. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't, you know, think about this stuff and enjoy it, but try to think about it in the author's perspective as much as possible. Yeah. Okay. okay. The English word honey is madu in Sanskrit and mayad in Russian. Uh, All right, so it's just more examples. Sanskrit and Russian haven't shared a common ancestor since Indo-European. So these words had to come from the same source. So they're they're comparing uh, Sanskrit and Russian here, the madu, which is M-A-D-H-U, and and Russian, it's M-Y-O-D. So very similar kind of look and probably pronunciation. And so they're just, the author is saying, hey, these these probably came from the same place. Cool. There are also the words mead in English, met in German, and majad in Danish that refer to an alcoholic drink made from honey. Uh, Okay, so just one final example. I like how we end on alcohol. I'll take it. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, one final example of of kind of this uh, common ancestor language. Yeah, I could see so many questions on this stuff, right? Like they'll give you, oh, imagine this word, and you know which one would the author would say is most similar to it, and the author uses pronunciation as the basis of their similarity. Mm-hmm. So you have to pick something that kind of sounds you know, pronounces the same way, if that makes any, if that makes any sense. So pronunciation is one way or one attribute that they use to make that similarity. Yeah. Great. Okay. So what's the main, what's the big picture? What's the main idea? Like what, what should you really know? Uh, apparently it's not about how lox is a quintessential New York food, <laughs> but <laughs> it is, it is really about how we trace our language, uh, how we find our common ancestors in language, 
uh, how there's this core vocabulary and uh, kind of the root of it all. Exactly. Yeah. So ancestors using, you know, we can find it using core vocab. They pronounce the same, you know, it's similar um, words. Um, and that's about it. Yeah. If you know that, if you know, those little details, the context within this bigger idea, then you, you should be able to get every question right. All right. So there you have it. Another great episode. Hopefully you followed along, you read, you broke down the sentences, you listened to see how we broke down the sentences, and hopefully you will improve your car score because of this. We have heard from many people who use this podcast for free and have improved their car score by a great amount because they are taking the time to actually listen to what we're saying, to actually do the exercises themselves first and then listen to us as we go. So. I hope this was helpful for you. If you're looking for some more great resources, go to jackweston.com. Whether you're looking for a course for more in-depth kind of one-on-one personal help, go, go check him out. If you're looking for some free daily MCAT cars passages right into your email inbox, again, jackweston.com. Let him know that you heard about him here on the podcast from Dr. Ryan Gray. Have a great week. We'll see you next time here on the MCAT cars podcast. This is MedEd Media.